welcome to the latest installment of Truth Noir. Uh, I'm joined by a old friend of the show and uh, art curator, artist, pop culture journalist, and co-host of uh, uh, Matt Gleason's Modern Art Blitz. Modern Art Blitz, also on DroneBox.com, uh, that shows on Sundays between five, at five o'clock. We're live at five. 5 p.m. Sundays, so uh, they have all kinds of artists from the area and from abroad, I think, as well. Yes, we do. As and far away as Sacramento. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, just if you're into art, watch Modern Art Blitz. It's pretty fantastic. Um, so I, uh, if, if you recall from last time, uh, Lisa and myself were reading the Constitution a few weeks ago, which that whole thing is still forthcoming and I'm still editing. <laughs> but, but, uh, but you know what was awesome about doing that is that now I can say to people, well, according to Article 1, Section 8 of the United States Constitution, because yeah, yeah. I read it out loud and it like stuck in my in my wee brain. Yeah, well, I wanted to make sure that it, I don't know if how many other people have read the entire Constitution in some kind of live format, but if not, I wanted to make sure there was at least one out there <laughs> that that was the whole from beginning to end. So yes, as opposed to being cherry picked. Right. Yeah. Um, so today, uh, Miss Derek has come back to talk to us about uh, cult symbolism in art, both uh, classical and modern. Yeah, and I mean, this is this is a subject that could take up endless hours. So. Absolutely. Instead of cherry picking the Constitution, I cherry picked some of my favorite artists and from a more modern period and also threw in some traditional artwork. And there's probably plenty more we can discuss as well. For S sure. Skulls, bones, the usual. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, and it, uh, as with all of these topics, it, this is stuff that I have been wanting to, uh, you know, broach for a long time, waiting for the, uh, you know, appropriate person to come along to talk to me about it with, um, you know, because a, a lot of this stuff gets attributed to mistaken as, uh, you know, any other thing under the sun, and a lot of it, a lot of those assumptions are made uh, pretty much out of complete ignorance, <laughs> and so... Um, so yeah, to help us uh, understand some of these symbols just by themselves and also their context within some of these pieces of art, uh, we're glad to have you along with us. It's so thank you pleasure. so much. I'm, I'm stoked to be here. I really am. Um, so uh, would you mind giving us a little bit of your background in uh, your study of uh, the art and symbolism mm -hmm. as you've come to understand it? Well, um, I've always been fascinated by the occult, and part of occult means hidden. So there's always things that are encoded in terms of language and in terms of the visual. And it was through really the symbolism of art that I was drawn, of, of the occult arts, that I was drawn to art. I find it amazing how, and also the creative process when you, you, tap into a zone in order to create. And you see that with artists, um, no matter what style of art, they're in a zone to make truly authentic art. And um, I just, I've always studied esoteric art and um, arts and art. And I love, you know, the symbolists, the narratives, art, um, and in Dutch still life, because it's they represent life and death and rebirth, though, um, and that this is, you know, strictly a Christian art form. So, even though it does not appear to be religious, Dutch still lives have aspects of life, death, and rebirth. It's encoded Catholicism because Catholicism was squelched by the Protestant Revolution. Right. Yeah. So that's so you'll see that it's slightly transgressive, and then there's messages in the flowers and the colors. We're not going into that. We're going to be talking about the darker aspects of, <laughs> you know, the oogum boogum stuff. But. Right. But yeah, so uh, well, let's, uh, let's go ahead and jump right into it. Okay. Um, so uh, why don't you tell us about this uh, first piece that you've picked this out for us here. This is a piece of alchemical art, and alchemy 
most of us think that it's some, it's a, the concept of transmuting lead into gold and the various stages of the alchemical process, which was just basically like, have you ever like mixed salt and vinegar and thrown it on copper and seen what happens? Uh, not that specifically, but yeah, I, I have, I, you know, I've done the, uh, uh, you know, the baking soda and vinegar volcano. Right. Yeah. Well, imagine <laughs> that kind of version of that on um, metal, and different metals produce different results, and that's what the alchemists were trying to do, was convert lead into gold, and each of the stages had a different name, including my favorite capit mortem, dead skull, dead head, nice. <laughs> um, which is now, which is actually a paint color made from mummies it was originally really? made from mummy bones oh, mummy wow. skulls but now it's just called mummy brown and they don't hmm. use ground up mummies anymore but that's why hmm. we don't have a lot of mummies because artists needed to the bones were used for both magic and for art hmm. so this is this shows the male and female the opposites you have a disc and a cup you have male and female and it's the union of opposites that produces a change one of the things in occultism is and you know it sounds a little heteronormative but there's male and female positive negative um, and each of us no matter what our sexual persuasion d does have that um, you know that duality you can call it you know black and white or gold and silver or red and purple or whatever you want but we do we are made up of opposites. I mean, we're two halves, you know, two eyes, two hands, right. two nostrils, two yeah, front teeth. And so, yeah, and so that is like, at least the centerpiece is, you know, very obviously, um, you know, a, a figure that is half female on one side, half male. On the other. And you have the four colors. You have green, red, white, and yellow, which represent four stages. Um, you have two trees, which have different faces. So it's the union of opposites. It's solve a coagulate, dissolve and coagulate, tear apart, bring and together, destroy, things. rebuild. Okay. So that's, there you have it with that one. So, and that's an important, alchemy was, the church was like not too keen on it. But on the other hand, if these guys could turn lead into gold, then the church would be a lot richer. Right, yeah. So so, uh, so do that in the basement while we're... Uh, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So let's see what's, what you have up next Sure. Uh, we have... Another alchemical drawing. And here, this represents the three-headed dragon with the three elements of mercury, sulfur... And salt. Now these are the black figures above the heads. Of yes, the drawings, and um, they, you'll see the, those figures are also on the um, tarot card, the Wheel of Life. There's three creatures that move around, and it's three aspects of elements. You know, you have the four elements: fire, water, earth, and air, and these these are the chemicals that you would be using to produce transformation. Mercury. Yeah, because, quicksilver. <laughs> right, exactly. Sulfur, which creates a reaction, and salt. So this is the they were the transformational elements, the three headed dragon. Okay. And who is this by again? It's just an a traditional alchemical okay. drawing. It's not an actual it's artist unknown. Alchemical doodling, number twelve. Okay. All right, so this one looks a little bit more modern. Yes, this is Christopher Ulrich. He is a local artist in whose work you can see at the at the Wolf Skeller in um, Pasadena. He did the beautiful of uh, whoops Teutonic murals um, that are down. It's all this uh, the fairy tales and legends of Germany. He painted m giant murals downstairs. Oh wow! It's really, really freaking cool. And there's little Krampuses hidden here and there. Awesome. So um, you see the two-headed child. This, to me, is the lover's card in the tarot deck, which is about the union of opposites. It's, um, again, the male-female dark light coming together. And then you have the two-headed angel. And you've got water and earth 
and you have the red band, which is passion uniting them, and the six stars, the lovers, is the six card in the tarot deck. Okay. But it's the it's the union of opposites again. All right. What about the uh, two-headed baby down there? Two-headed baby. Well, we saw a two-headed person earlier. Right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And so that would be, y you could say it's like Janice looking in both directions. It's a hermaphrodite. Um, and it's the union. It's the result. It's those two coming together. Right. And, I mean, in a relationship, you have both people and then the relationship. And it's never wholly one Thing because each person has a part in it. Sure. All right, let's see what else we have here. Oh, Lenore Carrington. Isn't that beautiful? She is amazing. She, it's, I don't have enough time on this show to go into her storied <laughs> existence, but let's just say that at one point, her nanny arrived by submarine in Spain to kidnap her back because she'd fallen in with a bunch of bohemians and artists. Oh, wow. Yeah, and Max Ernst was one of her lovers. And she escaped her nanny by hiding in the Mexican embassy, and she seduced um, an embassy official and married him and moved to Mexico. So this is... You've got the black and white. This really references the magician tarot card in many ways. The black and white um, is the duality. You have the, and it's called the conjurer. And you have the magical table, and you have eggs, which um, are a feminine symbol. And then notice the black and white checks along the wall. We'll see that appear again and again throughout our little art tour. Yeah, that seems to pervade a lot of uh, occult art and symbolism in general that I've seen is, is that kind of combination of, right. of black and white. Yeah, because again, it's, it's, the, it's that duality. And I like that they're in the diamond form, so they're more, um, it's, it's more, it's a balancing act. And it references, of course, the body, which has um, its triangles, and the head, which is triangular. So that's it's just such a striking image, um, and the, you know you're absolutely correct. That checkered floor, and it it is based in Masonic symbolism. The, the Masonic temples have black and white checked floors, mm -hmm. and um, it's the checkerboard and the, their tiles. I mean, they say you're tiled, and anyway, I. Well, yeah, I think I think like masonry in itself would be like an entire separate. Oh my series goodness! Of shows. <laughs> oh my goodness! But their artwork and their symbolism is so be is so beautiful, and it's really affected American artwork. You see it with, um, you know, the all-seeing eye. I mean, just st taking it aside from our stepping aside from our currency, but you'll see, you know, the eye, the I will be seen in places, the keys, hands, checkered floors, columns. It's um, because America has a strong Masonic foundation. There's many, many, many. I'll go out and, like, with one of my friends and he'll run into a dude and he'll be, oh, yeah, I know him from Masonry. It's like, wait, you're both me Like, and these were, like, not people I would necessarily, you think. Yeah, associate with each other. <laughs> Well, with or, each other or with masonry, it's like, dude, you have dreadlocks and you're a mason? Like, what? <laughs> well, and, and that's, I think the symbolism is what subconsciously, like this artwork is so striking and it draws attention. And so many times, you know, people are just like, oh, well, it's a cool picture, but like, not really knowing what it is that it right. is, that is drawing their attention, or they do know and it resonates with them. It is, however, very easy just to throw like, oh, I'm going to throw in skull and crossbones here. I'm going to throw in an eye or the a hamsa hand or something, and just because that's cool. But it doesn't resonate the same way as a piece that's that's that comes from that. Um, expression where you're using traditional symbols to convey either 
those meanings or an, another meaning. And one of the reasons these symbols are so powerful and occult symbols in general is because it's transgressive. These are secret societies. These are secret symbols. We're not supposed to have this knowledge. It's silence. So it's transgressive. And by breaking taboos, we're able to access parts of our brain that we wouldn't otherwise. Like, remember when you were a kid and you did something you shouldn't? <laughs> and that kind of like feeling of uh oh liberation. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And what we're all striving for is liberation um, from our societal constraints, from um, from the the our meat suits, you know, from the <laughs> right. cycle of reincarnation. Who knows? But the idea, like, to be free, and that's one of the things this country was founded on, was the idea that we're supposed to be free. So one way we can be free is by creating using whatever symbols and methods we choose. Right, yeah, and, and a, a freedom of the spirit, it would exactly. seem. Exactly. Not just a, uh, um, you know... Freedom from death. <laughs> yeah, freedom, <laughs> freedom, freedom to from vote for your favorite... Uh, whomever. Mascot puppet. <laughs> right, yeah, freedom from acid indigestion. And one thing that... <laughs> one thing is that often artists use their artwork or they can use their artwork as as sigils as magical devices to, or to indicate where they are or where they came from or where they would like to be and they're projecting their thoughts and energies into this as they're creating it and they're creating a living more or less living but a form that allows them to move to the next stage. And we'll be seeing that with, you know, with every piece, basically. Okay. Hopefully. Sure, yeah. Uh, let's, uh, let's take a look at the next one. Uh, As Above, So Below is the title of this. And um, it's by Rafael Reyes. And you see the, you, another reoccurring theme that we're going to see throughout here is the symbolism of horns especially curved horns. Okay, well, what do those mean? Well, just think about it. Who has horns? Animals. Who else? Well, what's an anthropomorphic form that has horns? You horny... Oh, devil, the devil. <laughs> really? Sorry, I'm a little slow this evening. <laughs> but yeah, of course. Right, so, but this is skulls, which appear in Masonic artwork. Skulls, of course, represent, uh, you know, we, we all die. So the skulls are dead things. So there's that. And then there's certain geometric artwork that has profound meaning for him, as well as the traditional six-point, the hexagram, which is used um, in occultism. A, many people recognize it as the symbol of the country of Israel, the state of Israel, but in fact, in it is the male and female energies. The downwards is the female, the upwards is the male. Okay. And what about the, uh, now I see a five-pointed star in the middle of Well, the that. five points are the five elements, and the fifth is spirit. The downward point means that you're drawing those energies from heaven into yourself. The, um, you're pulling them in as opposed to sending them out upwards. Upwards is, you know, it's like the Vitruvian man. Downwards right. is, and, and downwards is, you know, the self. It's a more okay. self-oriented. And um, he has his own... Uh, take on it with the lines that um, intersect the square that intersects the uh, pentagram, which um, is his own. And I can't really see what's in each of the stars' points from here because my eye, my eyes just aren't what they used to be, Sonny. Yeah, well, you, <laughs> for you and me both, I, I am having a little trouble making them out too. Yeah, but, it's, but it's a it's a beautiful piece. It's very strong and. There's, you'll notice there's the downward pointed pentagrams at the top and the upward on the bottom, which contrast with the, the skull, the skull's thickness. And also, perhaps that skull, the top one, 
is actually a person with their legs spread. Ah. Check that out. Yeah, definitely could be. <laughs> yeah, I mean the the way yeah, yeah the way uh -huh. it is the detail in it is depicted. I I, yeah. I see it now. Yeah, exactly. So there's, and um, you know there's there is. It, it, anyway, there's certain. Yeah, I'm gonna blush if I talk too much. So let's. <laughs> but um, I, the the male and female switch. I mean, p part of what goes on in um. In occultism, there's um, different ways of transcendent, and, and of course, you know, one way is through um, the sex act, and there's certain sex acts that have that balance, and I'll just, we'll just move on from there, because sure. there might be someone's child watching. <laughs> All righty. Moving right along. Let's oh, Austin Osmond Spare whose um, tarot cards, this is one of them, has just been released okay. as a book. So um, I felt it important to do this. Spare was an actual real-life student of Crowley in the AA, which is not the 12-step AA, but the um, secret society. Right. And I cannot reveal what those letters stand for because um, I don't know them. No, because I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I can't say. Um, but the um, he would go into trances and do automatic very much more so than and I'm sure like when you're writing or doing things you fall into that zone. Sure. Imagine somebody who can put themselves into that zone and then create, or they would go into it more quickly. Um, but he was also a very well known. He was a fine painter, a fine arts painter, as well as an automatic painter and he was during world war one he was actually a, an official war painter oh really yes yes um he labored in more or less obscurity though occasionally he his work would find revival during like the post-war period and then again um during the 70s because of the interest in art nouveau and arts and crafts okay. um but what he's one of the things he did was to de develop something called the alphabet of desire which was a way to turn letters for what you desired and required into a sigil that you would then send out, you'd, you'd set it and forget it, basically. But his, his card reading deck is fascinating, and I, I look forward to, to obtaining the book. Um, but we have another piece by him as well, which you'll find um, equally as moving and it fits in, but it, the, there's a reversed meaning on this, so it ties into as above, so below. Sure. There's the upright and the reversed, and sometimes tarot cards have that, and sometimes they don't. If you read with the Crowley card, you, you don't take into, you don't, it doesn't matter if it's right or, or upside down, you just, okay. you just take it in context. But this is definitely upright, not upright, so. Just his use of, of the watercolors and the lines. So, and then you've got that the crescent moon, which references we've seen the crescent moon before, right? And it references the feminine, and but then there's the star in it as well. So those are, you'll see crescent moons and stars throughout um, a lot of occult art because it's such a beautiful. The star is usually Venus, okay. which has. Um, layers of meaning that we could probably do a whole show on. The evening star, the morning star, the color green, the light bearer, but anyway. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and it's not just, yeah, it, it's not just a female symbol. Well, it's also it's the symbol of Islam is this crescent and star. Right. Um, and oddly, they it's green. And yeah, there's like that's just oh my goodness that's I that's about the extent of my knowledge of Islam right there so <laughs> let's just move along sure all right next up we have <gasps> that and I mean look it's it's the it's a dark angel in fact it is the dark angel that is a portrait of Jack Parsons the JPL rocket scientist who was also an occultist painted by his wife Marjorie Cameron. And um, 
he was very much a dark angel. And um, you, the arms are down, but he's still winged. So you do have that as above, so below right. again. And um, there's uh, who the dark angel is usually considered to be Lucifer, who fell from heaven, the rebellious one. And we, we just spoke about how rebellion can open certain circuitries in the brain, sure. the, the transgressive aspects. And Parsons certainly was transgressive, as was his wife. They, um, through bohemian parties, they did occult rituals. Actually, in their home, out, um, w during their, um, when they would do the Gnostic Mass, which is the, um, the religious ceremony of the OTO, the Order of Templi Orientis, um, the Harry Hay, the great gay rights um, advocate and um, rebel leader, basically, he would play piano, oh, and really? John Carradine showed up for a couple. Oh wow! Yeah, exactly. And of course, L. Ron Hubbard was a um, was a tenant of Parsons, mm -hmm. and he and Parsons did ritual ritual magic in the desert. And um, Jane Wolfe, the silent film actress, was also a resident. Yeah, and that's like it, that's it's the the in looking into this so many of these figures are pretty much from our backyard here in Pasadena LA. I mean just 10 minutes away on the freeway yeah. from our secret s studio here in Boyle Heights right yeah but yeah they uh, yeah I actually just got done reading their biography of Jack Parsons and uh, which one strange angel or um, oh what's the other one sex and rockets uh, strange angel strange angel yeah yeah it's just, but yeah, very, very interesting stuff. And then to be able to like drive by where these people lived and well, worked. Well, now it's a condo, but now yeah. it's a condo, but you, you can still go walk around Caltech and mm -hmm. the administrative okay. building is named after him. And can I tell you something really free? And I should have, I should have, but it's my own artwork, so I didn't want to like pump myself. But um, this is <laughs> this is the fascinating part about it's in the about Jack Parsons, you know. Um, his magical name, he was known in the OTO as Brother 210. The freeway yeah. that runs yeah, yeah. past his home on, his old home on Orange Grove out to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory was built after his death. It's the 210 freeway. And I still get chills when I say that. So now was was his name a numerical value? Yes. Or was, was it, it a new? It was a numerical value. It okay. was, and I cannot say the Latin um, at all. But it it numerically worked out to brother. So they just called him Brother Two Ten. That is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So. Very cool. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of freaky. Uh, also, if you realize that eleven is one of the, is the magical number of Babylon, it's considered, you know, a sacred number magically. Um, and it was, uh, Parsons had said to his friend Ray Bradbury, Ray, man will walk on the moon in your lifetime. What, 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 what mission walked on the moon? What a, oh, wow, yeah, Apollo 11. Okay, moving right along. <laughs> <laughs> moving right along. All right. Here is traditional Masonic art, and I just I put this in so that people could see, we could all see. There's the six pointed star. You can't see it here, but there's a checkerboard floor, the interlocking triangles, angels' eyes, the sun, the temple. There isn't an all seeing eye in there, but that's you know kind of a a well known one. And just this is a beautiful piece of folk art but it also shows the different symbols that you'll find throughout occult uh, art. There's the rooster, you know, when the cock, the cock crows three times, you will have betrayed me. That's a Christian symbol. Right, yeah, and so now, obviously we have uh, Jesus crucified mm -hmm. on the left, and uh, now is this St. Peter on the right? I believe that is St. Peter. Uh, on my rock, and they said, you, you will build a church, and. Peter, you are my rock. Peter, of course, comes from the, has as its Latin root the word for rock. Um, yeah, 
Yeah, so you've got Jesus. Right, Jesus and Peter, which is actually, Petrus is a great wine, too. Um, But that's another story. That's another show is wine tasting. It's also a very good Belgian beer. Mm, Good to know. (laughs) You have cross swords. You have the Lamb of God, the, the Holy Scripture. So there's, masonry has a degree has a degree. <laughs> <laughs> it has of 32 of them from what I've heard. 33, baby. But oh, who's sorry. counting? There's the Shriners. You know the guys in the little cars and the hats? Oh, but yeah. you, um, it has a degree of Christian symbolism. Um, For sure. Because, you know, it's, but it starts out in the Old Testament with the Temple of Solomon, the building of the Temple of, the so- of Solomon. And the, the myth of Hiram of Biff and the widow's son. And that's a whole, it's, that's something you, you would want to get a Mason who can, who's able to discuss these things on sure. the show with you. And if you need to find a Mason, let me know. I can. T- I will absolutely do that. Yeah, I've got, I've got some, <laughs> boy, honey, have I got a Rolodex for you. Um, <laughs> but there's the ladder because, you know, and Mason. Is this Jacob's ladder we're talking I about? I believe that is Jacob's ladder, climbing the ladder to heaven. The stairway to heaven. There's a stairway to heaven and a highway to hell. Yeah, which kind of uh, lets you know the uh, traffic. uh, Yeah, exactly what they're planning. I'm not climbing any stairways, man. Just, I'm going to get an Uber. Uber to the highway. (laughs) Uber to hell. Well, I'd like a limo, but it depends on who's paying. The the song for the new generation. That'll, that'll be the one that Axl Rose sings with <laughs> ACDC. Uber to hell. Oh my God. Oh my goodness. All right. From the sublime to the ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what we like to do here at Truth More. Of course. Okay, I'm really creeped out by our uninvited guest over here. When when is he, when is they going to come in and? Uh, you know, they haven't killed anyone yet. They haven't come in to make themselves known. The, uh, the alien itself is still uh, culted. Mm-hmm. It is. Not very well, because we can make out its Do you think they form, know but... that we can see them? Uh, yeah. I, I, don't think, I don't think it's a cat. Cats will f- think they're hiding in plain sight. I, I think the alien knows that we're talking about them oh, every once in a while. Oh, oh, oh. I just, like, if, if they wave, I'm going to scream. I don't, I don't handle horror films real well. Another piece <laughs> of Masonic symbolism. Here we have the sun and the moon. Yes, yeah, so we have a bunch of it in this one. Okay, can I just say base, baseball? Baseball has been very, very good to it. If you, let's just take a look. Abner Doubleday, who developed the game of baseball, was a high-ranking Mason. He also did the index for Madame Blavatsky's Isis Unveiled. Oh, really? <laughs> Very yeah, interesting. Yeah. So let's just, let's just use our imaginations for a moment and look at that as a baseball diamond with the G as the pitcher's mound. The okay. game of baseball can go on for infinity. Sometimes it feels like it does. Yes, and the outfield is there is... Like, the field is endless. Like, if somebody could run and chase that home run and catch it in the parking lot, then it would be out. There isn't, it's not, there's bound, there's no boundaries. It's a boundaryless game. And the space between the bases and the mount was originally 66 feet. 66 feet. Mm -hmm. So that's just a little bit of um, all-American symbolism there. Baseball is a, is actually a Masonic meditation on man's potential, and by man I mean everyone, but right, yeah, humanity's no, it's potential. A, it's a very interesting uh, uh, interpretation. I'd never thought about it that way before. Well, <laughs> <laughs> and then of course the sun, the moon, night and day, the all-seeing eye of God, the six stars, which I have no idea why there's six. I, you know, really there's six and then seven, six, that one's beyond me. Again, I can get you a mason. I can get you some of the coolest masons ever. You'd be stunned. Well, yeah, and so it seems like, I mean, given that analogy, it seems like the object of the game, of that game, is to project yourself outside of the diamond, right? 
home. I think it's to hit a home run. I think it's to get to home base, baby. <laughs> no, it's not mm. to hit the ball out of the out of the park. Into Maybe the... well, that's how you would get to home base. <laughs> um, but well, I do want to talk about the pillars for a second. Traditionally, the pillars are dark and light, um, representing um, the pillar of severity and the pillar of mercy. Okay. And um, the in the priestess card. In the tarot, she sits between the two. She's the balance between the two. So that's just, you know, the light and the dark. Again, the duality. What were they again? Severity and, and mercy. Mercy, yeah. right. Okay. All right, let's see what we have next. Oh, this another, is by Christopher Ulrich. Another a, three-headed... Uh, a three-headed creature. And he's got... The sun being devoured by the moon, the moon being devoured by the sun, and the planet Mercury. And it's the three-headed creature that we saw before. This piece is called The Journey. Um, and there's another alchemical drawing called Python that has a similar three-headed creature with um, its tail wrapped around those pieces. Um, okay. And it's just sort of how the, the alchemical detailing and symbolism has moved through for those who are interested in it, you know, into the the modern canon of art, and you'll see it with Mark Ryden's work, which I did not bring, but he's such a prof. That's Ryden, R Y D E N. He uses um, alchemical symbols. He uses the All Seeing Eye of God. He uses that very painterly Masonic style, um, and he sort of created his own symbols within the symbols. So. But I, just, I love Christopher Ulrich's work. It's so fresh. Look at that sky. I mean, that's not digital. Yeah, that that's hand-painted. It is very vibrant. And what he does with his, um, his creatures and his bodies is he starts off by painting the bones. And then he paints the muscles and the tendons oh, wow. and the sinews. And then he puts the flesh on them. Wow. Yeah. He doesn't just go, I'm going to draw a, a curvy chick. No, he builds, he builds, he is, he yeah. is creating in the same way that gods create. He is creating a world. He is creating creatures. Now, that, that is fascinating. I, mm -hmm. I, that's yeah. very yeah. interesting. He's, he's an astounding painter, astounding. And let's see what's up next. Ah, uh, the visit to the psychologist. But yet she's, it's, is it Salome with the head of John the Baptist? Is she dropping her veils? It's just, you'll see the floating head um, for, as a frequent symbol because John, and you know, there's this, the whole idea of John the Baptist was really supposed to be the important one. But this just struck me because, and it also looks like a sperm, it looks like a sperm. Right. And she's holding it in her hand in the hermit card the hermit is holding a lamp, but the hermit card is Yod, which um, is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It is It means hand. So here, she's standing like the hermit instead of a lamp to show an honest man like Diogenes, to light the way. She's holding the, the head of a man or perhaps a sperm. So it's a, it's a nice multi-leveled twist right, yeah. to traditional occult symbolism. It's just, and it, she, the horns, the horns. You see, she's got horns. Look, she's got horns. <laughs> <laughs> and she's dressed in green, which is the color of the planet Venus, which we've discussed. Right. Oh, mm -hmm. It's funny how this just is all coagulating. Yeah, it, yeah <laughs> well, it, it definitely brings new meaning to the term a picture paints a thousand words, oh, especially with stuff like this. Exactly. There's layers and layers and layers. Uh, horns again. I, uh, I think we'll. Uh, Are we see. wrapping it up right now? Yeah. Which is—is is there one that you'd like let's to end see. on? Let, that, let's uh, uh, yeah, let's uh, let's run through all of these. Uh, let, the let's last just, one. Let's just spin through them and see what's there. These are. There we go. Let's just let's just go back to Baphomet as it, as it, as we were. So here is horns, dark light. Solve et coagulate. 
And we, we did a little bit of dissolving some of the symbols of occultism and Absolutely. coagulating our brains. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I even see now uh, in, in the torso of the body, are, is that the, uh, the kind of classic, uh, um, I forget what it's called, but the two serpents? Yes, the caduceus. In caduceus, fact, I have yes. One. Yes, so it's, it's the symbol of Mercury. It's also Mercury the god, Hermes, who's the, um, the, the messenger between the underworld, the gods, and man. He's, he's the herald of Hecate. Hecate, well, oh, that's a whole other, that's a whole other uh, Olympian soap opera. Right. But it represents, again, the union of opposites and creating that one pole. Um, so it could be, and this serpent-headed ones, you know, they're slightly serpent-headed. Um, there's the flame that comes up, and what you could you could say with our advanced scientific knowledge now that flame represents the 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 pineal gland, and or it's enlightenment, and the torch was you know the light bearer, the torch, enlightenment, Illuminati, illumination, mankind's sure. illumination through knowledge and freedom. Yeah, which even our own. Uh, favorite mascots of this country are not without. Columbia, holding the torch, the Statue oh, the, of Liberty. Uh, yeah, also known as. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly, holding that, that torch. And, you know, fireworks. Yeah. Fireworks, definitely. It's pit torches and pitchforks. Yeah, all the stuff you never thought quite about that way before. <laughs> Thank you so, so much for having me Lisa, on. Thank it's you been so much for awesome. Coming on and talking to I me about this I stuff. love being here, and you're so patient and kind with my like meandering ways. No, I love it. I because I mean it. You know, it all of this stuff. I thought to ask is some of it ends up getting answered without me having to say anything. And are you uh, saying like I cut you off? And no, no, like... <laughs> no. I, 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 and then some of it, you know makes me think like oh yeah well what about this and i wanted to ask about that too and so well anytime you want to have me on to, to and you know if you want to pull some stuff and just make me make me do some work go right ahead i would love to <laughs> I'll, be back. i'll ambush you with some no please do that's what i did with you you had no idea what you were going to get yeah no and that, here i was... threw i threw up a horrible horrible blasphemous symbology i know for shame <laughs> <laughs> oh i did it i did it for the shame baby i did it for the shame <laughs> all righty well thank you so much again thank you uh, we we absolutely have to do this again sometime uh because uh not just because you're infinitely cool and i like talking to you but like we really did just scratch the surface barely on uh, on this stuff there is uh, a lot more of it and uh, so yeah um, definitely worth looking into and deciphering it for yourself like uh, you know if, if get you, a book yeah if you were one of those people it was like no it's all just evil uh, no it's not it, it you know it represents all kinds of different stuff that uh, you know is apropos to daily life these symbols uh, before there was Satanism or some notion of that, these symbols had been around for thousands of years getting, um, you know, used in art to represent other things. And so, uh, you know, if you, do you like looking at art or, you know, then it's worth looking into and understanding on as many levels as there are to understand it on, or at least more than, you know, Superficial. we had thought oh, to before. It's, it's, so. it's, it's a dude with wing and boobs. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so anyways... We're, uh, we are completely out of time. Uh, you guys, thanks for watching. Thank you again to Miss Lisa Derrick for coming on and discussing these things with me. And wherever you're going, get there safe. We'll catch you next time. Bye.